Welcome to Yeshua House. I'm Pastor Danita Wilkerson, and this is Believer School. We started Believer School to help us understand our rights and responsibilities in Christ and to stop getting run over by the enemy. Um, a couple of announcements before we get started is next week we'll be broadcasting from the church. And then, uh, so the opportunity is there. If you want to come and join the live audience, you're welcome to do that. We'll continue um, with the online broadcast as well for those of us who are not ready to come back yet. And uh, homework check. If you finished your homework, go ahead and send me a little comment. Hey, Pastor Danita, I got my verses uh, memorized. You're looking for the Ephesians 1 and the Ephesians 3. Or just give me an update about where you're at. Did you get part of it memorized? Um, do you just, are you just still listening to it on your audio version and saying it along with it? Just where are you in your process? Uh, let's, let's get started. I'm really excited about tonight because we get to work on breaking the power of the devil in our lives and how to go about doing that. What is it about? How does it work? How do you access that as a believer? So um, let's get started with a word of prayer. There we go. All right. So Father, we just come to you tonight in the mighty name of Jesus. We just thank you and praise you for who you are and that you've chosen us, that we are your special people and that you loved us so much that you sent your son to die for us. And Father, right now, we just want to make you happy. Father, we just open our hearts to receive your word. And Father, we just say, come in, Holy Spirit, inner man, rise up in us. And just look in every area, every nook and every cranny. If there's something that makes you sad, Father, just bring it to our attention. And right now, we just choose to fall out of agreement with it. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. We just say, Father, I fall out of agreement with and name it. And we get into agreement with what your word says. Because you said if we were a hearer and a doer of your word, that we would do mighty things for you. And that's what we want to do. In the mighty name of Yeshua Mashiach, Jesus. Amen. Okay, so our homework scriptures. And we should be getting really familiar with these by now. Because we are on week four. And what we've done, for those who are new tonight, or for those who haven't followed along, is um, we're personalizing these scriptures. We took them out of the Bible, and then we've changed where he was talking to the church at Ephesus, and these scriptures we talked about, how they could be used for, well, the church in Plano, Texas, or the church in Oklahoma, or the church anywhere, but it could also be personalized for the individual. And so that's what we've done. So say these along with me as well as I say them, and um, we're going to start get going here. Here we go. I do not cease to give thanks for Pastor Danita making mention of Pastor Danita in my prayers that the God of our Lord, Jesus, the anointed one and his anointing, the Father of glory, may give unto me the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him or in the knowledge of who I am in him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened, that I may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards me who believes and according to and working of his mighty power which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion in every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. And he has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body the fullness of him that fills all in all. And then our second scripture that we're working on memorizing is Ephesians 3. So for this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the anointed one and his anointing, 
from whom the whole family of heaven and earth is named, that he would grant me, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ would, may dwell in my heart through faith, that me, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, and the height, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that I will, got that? I will be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all we could ask or think, according to the power that works in me, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all, through Christ Jesus, the anointed one and his anointing to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Okay, a little review. Ephesians 2, 1 through 6, it talks about how we were dead in our sin. We were dead in our offenses with God. And we had religious customs and values. We, we did things out of a, a sense nature out on this earthly realm um, because we were under the authority of the enemy, of Satan. And we didn't know the truth. And that was in us from birth. And it was expressed through everything we did, this self-life. So, it, it, you know, even some people say it's selfishness because everything is about me. We see everything from our perspective. We live with natural cravings and our mind is, is dictated. We're stuck. We're kind of rebellious children to God. And so he can't really love us the way he wants to. Um, and so in his compassion, when we were dead and doomed in our sin, he united us with Christ. Christ came and he died spiritually and he died physically. He took the consequences of sin and death for us. And with his wonderful grace, he raised us up with Christ, the exalted one, and we ascended with him into the glorious perfection and authority in the heavenly realm. For we are now co-seated as one with Christ, the anointed one in his anointing. We are set up in heaven at the right hand of God with Christ. Um, other scriptures say that he is the head and we are the body, represented of the body of Christ. When you became a new believer, when you accepted Jesus as your savior, and if you haven't done that, hang on, we'll get to that in a little bit. But when you accept Jesus as your Savior, you're made a new creature in Christ. You are a new being, many of the translations say. And when you become a new being with Christ, you are endowed with power from on high. Now, a lot of churches don't teach that, but we teach the word here. And it says in the word of God that you are given that power. And we talked about that being seated with Christ in the last lesson. So if you're not all the way caught up yet, Go back on YouTube and go to Yeshua House and watch that lesson from last week. They're in there by the date, so it makes it really easy to find. All right, let's move forward. So Ephesians 1, 20, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in heavenly places. You see, we're talking about authority of the believer. In the mind of God and in the mind of Father, uh, and Jesus, when Christ was raised, we were raised. Notice it also says that he raised us up together. Like, you can't separate a head from a body. He raised us up together so that we are one with Christ. And we need to know that. We need to realize that we are sitting with him right now. Now, in this very moment. Not, not in the time, not, not later. Now. With all the authority that, the, that Jesus had and operated with on the earth, we now have. And that authority belongs to us. And we're supposed to exercise that authority that was given to us through Jesus. Because it belongs to us. And we're going to notice it says that Jesus is in the heavenly places, but we carry out his duties on the earth. So we help him 
by doing our part. Okay, let's go to Ephesians 1 21, which is right afterwards. And we are seated, it says, far above, far above all principality, power, might, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in the one that's to come. You see, we're far above. So even the newest baby Christian who might have the very lowest place in Christ, which would what be a little toe, is still far above. And this far above is not a natural human far above, which I would consider like, okay, far above might be an airplane in the sky, you know? This is God's version of far above. And God sees, you know, small things as, you know, our universes and traveling through galaxies, you know, he, he's that his realm is so different. So we are far above principalities, powers, mights, and dominions. And everything that is named, not only in this world, but also in the world to come, you see? So that leads us into where we're getting started tonight. So the word of God teaches. Um, hold on, let's read the scripture first. So in Ephesians 6, 12, it says, this is real common. Many people already know what this says. So we're going to read it anyway. Um, you know, I've had, I've had uh, eggs and all my life, but it does not bother me to have another egg for breakfast, you know? And we wrestle not against flesh and blood, against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual forces of wickedness in high places. You see, the word of God teaches us that evil spirits are fallen angels who've been dethroned by Jesus. See, he kicked them out. He, it says that he paralyzed them. They, they, he took away all their power. So our contact with the spiritual realm of the devil should be with the knowledge that Jesus defeated them. It said in the King James, he spoiled them. Well, we might not understand what spoiled means, but if he spoiled them, and, and when we look back at when they had castles and kings, and one king would, would conquer another one and take all his things, then they would say that this king spoiled that king and put them to naught. He made them nothing. And that was in 2 um, Colossians 2.15. Now Jesus has dethroned them and we reign over them. You see, you see why we shouldn't have any fear of them? Because we reign over them in the name of Jesus. So Adam, when God made the earth, he gave it to Adam and he told him several times to, date, to take dominion. That he, he wasn't just there as a, you know, on a vacation. He was there to rule and reign and take dominion. And he, he told him to take dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and the land and the water and like everything there is, except he didn't say people. And I thought that was interesting. They didn't say, take dominion over people. He didn't. But Adam, while he was living on the earth, uh, in Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve are in the garden. They're taking care of the garden. And this snake shows up, and he's talking. And, and instead of say, telling this talking snake to get out of the garden, Adam and Eve listen. Well, and I think maybe they weren't right together because Eve seems to have this conversation and Adam doesn't seem to be like paying any attention. Um, and I kind of think if a snake's talking to you and he's kind of coming at you, that is a girl, we, we might back up and even back up into the tree of good and the knowledge of good and evil. And so I think she backed up into it and then realized because she said, if I, eat, if I even touch it, I'm going to die. And she touched it and she didn't die. And so then she thought, oh, well, if that's not true, then maybe I can eat of it too. And so she saw it was good for food and thought, mm, boy, that looks tasty. And so she ate it. And then the Bible says that she gave it to Adam and he ate of it. But the word also says that Adam knew that that was from the tree of good and evil, and he knew he wasn't supposed to. And God himself had spoken to Adam and told him, don't do this. So when Adam chose to eat of that fruit, he committed high treason and gave all of us, the entire human race, over to the power of Satan. 
And, you know, Adam didn't have a moral right to commit treason, but he had a legal right. He could do it legally because God had given it to him, full thing. So now Satan has the right to be here and to be the God of this world until Adam's lease runs out. Satan had the right to rule over us until we became a new creature in Christ. When we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we become body of, the, of that anointed one and his anointing. We become his body and we're new creatures. And Satan loses his power. So let's see how um, Colossians 1 follows along with this. So your hearts can soar with grateful gratitude when you think of how God made you worthy. Now this is for all my little friends. Been there, done that, who don't feel worthy. You're not worthy because of something you've done. God made you worthy when you accepted Jesus as your Savior. You are worthy to receive the glorious inheritance freely given to us by living in the light of Jesus. He has rescued us completely from the tyrannical rule of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom realm of his beloved son. So you see, that's why Satan doesn't have the right to rule over and dominate us. Yet the average Christian has no more faith, has more faith actually than Satan's authority and power than he does in God's. The Bible only talks about the first man, Adam, but it also talks about the second Adam, Jesus, the anointed one and his anointing, who came here to be our substitute, to take the consequences for sin. Okay, let's see what 1 Corinthians 15 says. It says, Jesus, you see, Jesus was called the last Adam. And here in verse 47, he's called the second man. All that Jesus did, he did for us. Our trouble is that we tend to relate everything to the future. Most church people believe they will experience spiritual authority sometime in the millennium. You know, that's after Jesus come and rescue the church and, and, and we go through the, the great war that we're going to have total authority over Satan. Well, if that's the case, then why does it say that in the Bible that Satan will be bound during the millennium and there will be that means that we'll have no need to exercise authority because there's nothing that will hurt or destroy. Uh, you see, we have this authority now. When there's something that will hurt or destroy, that we have authority over it, you see, in the name of Jesus. But many people believe today that we don't have much authority today at all. Uh, they say that, you know, the people in the early church, oh, yeah, they had authority, but we don't have it anymore. Um, they think Satan's running everything down here. And, and we must remember that although we're in the world, we're not of the world. Satan is running a lot that's down here on the earth, and that's what's wrong with the earth. But you know what? He's not running me. He's not running the church unless we let him. He's not dominating us. We dominate him. We have authority over him. And we have authority over everything he's done because of Jesus. Let's look over here in Luke. Jesus said, I understand that I have imparted to you. You need to understand this. I have imparted to you all my authority to trample over Satan's kingdom. Jesus gave us all his authority to trample over the devil's kingdom. So you'll trample over every demon before you, and you will overcome every power Satan possesses. Absolutely nothing will be able to harm you as you walk in this authority. So the, does our church nowadays have less authority than they did right after Jesus's death, burial, and resurrection, you know, seating at the right hand of the Father? 
Well, you know, if that's true, it'd have been better for Jesus not to have died. Blessed be God. You see, we have that authority. Jesus gave it to us. The problem is, is we don't know it. There, there's not churches teaching this right now. If you're, if you're not plugged into places like this, you're not getting the truth and, and what the Word of God says about this. We need to build these truths into our lives by meditating and feeding on the Word of God and on these truths until they become part of our consciousness. Naturally speaking, we eat foods every day because, you know, doctors and nutritionists tell us, you know, we need certain vitamins and minerals and other nutrients um, to be able to be healthy. Well, we need to take the word of God in every day to be healthy Christians. Jesus in Matthew 28 said that when he rose from the dead, he gave he had all authority given to him. All is given to him, not only on earth, but in heaven. All authority. All the authority that can be exercised upon the earth has to be exercised through Christ's body or the church or us believers, right? Because Christ isn't here in person anymore, right? His physical body is gone and he's at the right hand, a human being, He's at the right hand of God the Father. He is our advocate. He is our high priest. He's our lawyer, right? So even though we pray, now, Lord, will you do something about that, leaving everything up to him? He has confirmed his authority on the earth in his body and the church, us believers, you see, we have to do something. Many, many, many problems exist because we as believers don't do anything about it. We don't stop them. Uh, we're the ones who are supposed to do something about it. But we're trying to, we want to use someone else's faith. We want to go to the pastor and use his faith. Or we want to go to the prayer leader and use their faith. We need to learn to use our faith. And this has become very real for me. Uh, while at first I couldn't explain it, but I knew in my spirit as I began to understand our authority and the authority we have. Uh, I even saw in Kenneth Hagin's story when he tells about his brother's salvation. His name was Doug, I think. Kenneth um, had fasted and prayed and prayed and fasted. And, you know, it seemed like that uh, the more he fasted and prayed, the worse Doug got. And then he was seeking the Lord one day, and the Lord said, you do something about it. And Doug was kind of the black sheep of the family. But when Kenneth heard, you do something about it, Kenneth was, um, had released, he released a prayer for his brother. Um, he said that he had um, he had always prayed for him, and can um, he even him says he backslid into saying, "Hey God, you need to do something about this." But God challenged him to do something about it, and told Kenneth that you have authority. And so Kenneth said this. You might want to write it down. It's really important. In the name of Jesus, I break the power of the devil over my brother's life, and I claim his salvation. Well, Kenneth, you know, that's done, check mark, got it. He went on about ministry, and he was staying in this parsonage, and one afternoon, a few days after he had prayed this prayer, he, uh, he was walking from the study into the kitchen, and he got right to the edge of the kitchen to make a step out, and he heard this voice say, well, you don't think your brother will actually be saved, do you? And Kenneth stopped right there, and he, he started laughing. This laughter rose up inside of him, and he said, No, devil, I don't think Doug will get saved. I know Doug will be saved, because I broke your power over him, and I released salvation to him. And 
Kenneth went on about what he was doing. A few more days went by. And in the very same spot, you know, like he was walking out of the kitchen back in, that same phrase showed up again. And the laughter rose up in Kenneth and the word rose up in Kenneth. It said the same thing. And so it was a total of 10 days after he had initially made that prayer that Doug, Dub, accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And, you know, the one thing that Kenneth said, you know, he didn't keep saying that same prayer over and over again. It's like, he said it, he closed the book on it, I know it's done, he said this sign. Now, sometimes we, we go back and thank God for it, but we're not spending our time focusing on the fact that it's not done. Because you see, when a king gives an order, he knows it's going to be carried out. There is no doubt in a king's mind when he says, you go do something, boom, it's going to happen, right? So it happens. His brother was saved. So as long as Satan can keep us in unbelief or hold us in the reason, the air, arena of reason, you know, that would be our sense knowledge, our, our, what we see, what we hear, what we feel that he can whip us in every battle. But if you hold him in that arena of faith, or in that area of faith and spirit, you'll beat him every time. He won't argue with you about the name of Jesus or the blood of Jesus. He's afraid of the name and the blood. And I found the most effective way to pray is when you demand your rights. So, that's how I pray. I demand my rights. Um, like Peter did at the gate called Beautiful with the lame man. Here, let's look at it in Acts chapter 3. And then Peter said, at the gate called Beautiful, he didn't pray for the lame man. He demanded that he be healed. So you're not demanding of God when you're demanding your rights. You're demanding them of the devil in the name of Jesus. You see, Jesus made another statement that goes along with this one in John chapter 14. And you see, here in John chapter 14, he's not talking about prayer. Uh, and then it says, for I will do whatever you ask me to do whenever you ask me in my name i will do it for you he's not really talking about prayer he doesn't say anything about prayer and in the greek when you look at that word ask it means demand so i will do whatever you demand of me to do when you demand in my name, I will do it for you. See, when you demand it in Jesus' name, it takes it out of the enemy's hand. It gives you that authority. You're operating by the Spirit in the name of Jesus and the blood of Jesus. You see, and on the other hand, over here in chapter 16 of John, now this is prayer. It says, For here is an eternal truth that when that time comes, you won't need to ask me for anything, but instead you will go directly to my father and ask him for anything you desire. He will give it to you because you have relationship with me. Until now, you have not been bold enough to ask the father for a single thing in my name. See, it's in the name of Jesus, but now you can ask and keep on asking him. And you can be sure you will receive what you ask for, and your joy will have no limits. So you see, the Father is mentioned here in connection with prayer. He's not mentioned over in John chapter 14. And the Greek actually reads, whenever you demand your rights and privileges, you've got to learn what your rights and privileges are. Many years ago, um, Pastor Hagen tells a story of when he was pastoring a little church in Texas. And a woman brought her violently insane sister to the parsonage to be prayed for because this woman had tried to kill herself and others. Um, she had been placed in a padded cell for two years. However, her sister's health had deteriorated and the doctors recommended a furlough at home because she was no longer considered dangerous. When the sister was introduced to me 
as the preacher. And this is Kenneth telling the story. She started rolling out her mouth scriptures right and left. She thought that she had committed the unpardonable sin. And the Lord told Kenneth to stand in front of the lady and say, come out of her, you unclean devil, in the name of Jesus. And he did that. And nothing appeared to happen. I mean, the woman was just sitting there like a statue. But when you speak something like that in faith, you know if that spirit has, you know by faith, you, you can sense that thing in the spirit. If that went out of you and you know if it was received or not. Kenneth knew he had spoken the word of faith. So you don't have to stand there all day long commanding devils to come out. They're going to go when you tell them if you know your authority. They have to go once you command is given in faith. So a few days later, the lady from the church came to the parsonage and told Aretha and Kenneth, oh, this woman's having a violent attack. It was just like the episode she had before she started being insane and Kenneth just looked at her and said oh that demon he sometimes they just rip and tear at people on their way out he said it'll just last a little while and the lady will be fine and the lady from the church looked at Kenneth and said ah, that's exactly what her sister said well a little while later the doctor pronounced her normal and sent her home for good 20 years later she is happy and healthy teaching Sunday school and working in a business. You see, faith is involved in exercising spiritual authority. Yes, there are times when the spirits come out immediately, but they, when they don't, and when you speak the word of faith, don't get disturbed about it. We base our faith on what the word of God says. Some people's faith is not based on the Bible, however. It's based on seeing something or hearing some kind of manifestation. We often call it sense knowledge. They operate outside of the faith realm, looking at their senses. If they get a certain manifestation, they think the devil's gone. But he isn't necessarily gone because you see a certain thing or hear a certain thing. He could still be there. You need to know how to exercise your authority. When circumstances don't change immediately, some people begin to get discouraged and slip back into the natural and they start, you know, talking unbelief and defeat. They actually defeat themselves. And, you know, they're giving the devil dominion over them. The role of faith in authority. Um, Smith Wigglesworth often says, I'm not moved by what I see. You see, I'm not moved by what I feel. I'm only moved by what I believe. So I stand my ground. Kenneth Hagin explained before he received the baptism in the Holy Ghost as a young Baptist pastor during the Great Depression, then he had to help support his mother and little brother. Uh, mom paid for the income tax, the utilities and the insurance, and then Kenneth bought the food. Um, Kenneth tells that he only owned one suit and one extra pair of pants for church. And during the depression days, there was much stealing that went on. Well, he went to his closet and someone had stolen both pairs of his pants. They were stolen on Monday. And he had to preach on Thursday. And so he prayed on Tuesday as he left his job, Lord, I've got all I've got is this pair of khakis, and I can't preach in them. They're my old work pants. And he told the Lord that by Thursday, I expect to see my stolen pants hanging right back there in my closet where I had them. He prayed that the person who stole them would be so miserable that they would have to bring them back. You see, it's wrong. It's a wrong spirit that makes someone steal. So Kenneth was dealing with the spirit, not the person because we have authority over spirits. And he commanded that spirit to stop this action. And when, it came, when he came home on Thursday afternoon, he knew those pants were gonna be there. And we can do that too, and should. 
rise up against the devil. So we base our faith on what the word of God says. And then I put Kenneth Hagin's quote up here. Uh, sorry, Smith Wigglesworth's quote up here. So the body of Christ has his authority. As believers, we have been made new creatures in Christ. And now we have the power of attorney to use the name of Jesus because we are his body in the earth. We can see today that we need to walk in the spirit and not in our five senses. This way we know what the Bible says and can stand and watch our faith works. So it's quiz time. So if you've got an extra piece of paper, go ahead and grab it or a pen to write with so you can write down your answers. And let's see how we're doing. Here we go. Oh, cool. Okay, this is good. In the mind of God, blank were raised when Christ was raised. And the answer is we. We were raised when Christ was raised. Number two, we are blank above all principalities, power, mights, and dominions. We are far above, far above all principalities, mights, and dominions. Number three, what do we wrestle against? Choose all that apply. A, principalities, B, powers, C, human beings, D, mites, and E, dominions. And the answer is principalities, powers, mites, and dominions. These are the things that we fight against. What was Adam not given power over? A, plants, B, animals, C, the water, D, people. Yeah, he was not given power over people. That's right. Okay, number five. When do we have authority in the name of Jesus? A, everybody has it. B, our ancestors did, but we don't. C, born-again believers have it when they are made believers in Jesus' body. D, we will, we will when we get to heaven. That's right. Born-again believers have it when they are made believers in Jesus. Okay, number six. Satan can control you as long... Uh-huh, yeah. As long as he can keep you in the sense realm. As long as he can keep you, you know, looking with your eyes, listening to your ears, uh, doing what your body says, he can control you. So where are we seated with Christ, the anointed one and his anointing? There's a couple of right answers for this one. So I have at the right hand of God and far above, right? Far above principalities, powers, mights, and dominions. Number eight, here we go. What is the power behind the authority of Christ? A, the Archangel Michael and Gabriel. B, God himself. C, the amount of time we spend in prayer and Bible study. D, all of the above. So what power is behind our authority in Christ? And the answer is B, God himself. God Almighty himself is behind the authority of the power of Christ. Number nine, what are you as a Christian supposed to do to rule, supposed to rule and reign over? Okay, is it disease? B, poverty. C, everything that would hinder you in your individual life or D, all of the above? And the answer is D, all of the above. Okay, the last one's a fill in the blank. What does Smith Wigglesworth say about his faith? I'm not moved by blank. I'm not moved by what I blank. I'm moved by what I Blank. Ready? Here we go. 
Uh huh. She says, I'm not moved by what I see. I'm not moved by what I feel. I'm moved by what I believe. And I normally finish that by saying, I believe the word of God. Well, each night, the Lord has asked me to make an opportunity available for anyone who isn't a believer yet, who hasn't accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, to have that opportunity to become a believer and be able to have that power and authority that Jesus has given us already. And it's not hard. We're going to say a prayer, and you just need to believe what you say as you say it. And God will do the rest. So here we go. I come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know that you will not cast me out. I come to you in the name of Jesus. And I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that Jesus died for me according to the scriptures. I believe that he was raised from the dead for my justification according to the scriptures so that I might be set right with God. And I believe that because of his death, burial, and resurrection, I am set right with God. So I receive Jesus as my Savior and accept Jesus as my Lord. Your word says in Romans 10 verses 9 and 10 that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I'm calling on the name of the Lord, so I know that I am saved. You said, if I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, that I would be saved. And with my heart, I believe I am made righteous with God. And with my mouth, I confess, I am saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Well, I hope you got a lot out of that lesson. Um, like I said, next week, we'll be teaching from the church. And uh, we're going to continue our study on uh, the believer's authority and how to exercise our authority as a believer. Y'all have a blessed week and we'll see you next week. God bless.